good day and welcome to the NextEra Energy and NextEra Energy Partners LP Third Quarter 2023 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing star then zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on a touchstone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Christian Rose, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Vaish. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our third quarter 2023 Combined Financial Results Conference Call for NextEra Energy and NextEra Energy Partners. With me this morning are John Ketchum, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of NextEra Energy, Kirk Cruz, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of NextEra Energy, Rebecca Java, President and Chief Executive Officer of NextEra Energy Resources, and Mark Hickson, Executive Vice President of NextEra Energy, all of whom are also officers of NextEra Energy Partners, as well as Armando Pimentel, President and Chief Executive Officer of Florida Power & Light Company. Kirk will provide an overview of our results, and our executive team will then be available to answer your questions. We will be making forward-looking statements during this call based on current expectations and assumptions which are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results could differ materially from our forward-looking statements if any of our key assumptions are incorrect or because of other factors discussed in today's earnings news release and the comments made during this conference call and the risk factors section of the accompanying presentation or in our latest reports and filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, each of which can be found on our website www.nextairaenergy.com and www.nextairaenergypartners.com. Do not undertake any duty to update any forward-looking statements. Today's presentation also includes references to non-GAAP financial measures. You should refer to the in information contained in the slides accompanying today's presentation for the definitional information and reconciliations of historical non-GAAP measures to the closest GAAP financial measure. With that, I will turn the call over to Kirk. Thanks, Kristen, and good morning. NextEra Energy delivered strong third quarter results, growing adjusted earnings per share approximately 10.6% year over year. In the quarter, FPL continued to deliver outstanding value to its customers in what we believe has been one of the most constructive regulatory jurisdictions in the nation. FPL's bills are well below the national average, and we are relentlessly focused on reliability and running the business efficiently. Energy Resources extended its leadership position in renewable energy during the third quarter with strong adjusted earnings growth and its best renewables and storage origination quarter in its history. NextEra Energy has clear growth visibility through FPL's capital plan and Energy Resources over 21 gigawatt renewables and storage backlog the strongest balance sheets in the sector and worldwide banking relationships, we believe NextEra Energy has both significant access to capital and cost of capital advantages and is well positioned to continue to deliver long-term value for shareholders. Now let's turn to FPL's detailed results. For the third quarter of 2023, FPL's earnings per share increased four cents year over year. The principal driver of this performance was FPL's regulatory capital employed growth, approximately 13.6% year over year. We continue to expect FPL to realize roughly 9% average annual growth in regulatory capital employed over our current rate agreement's four-year term, which runs through 2025. FPL's capital expenditures were approximately $2.6 billion for the quarter, and we expect FPL's full year 2023 capital investments to be between nine and nine and a half billion dollars. For the 12 months ending September 2023, FPL's reported ROE for regulatory purposes will be approximately 11.8%. During the third quarter, we reversed roughly $245 million of reserve amortization leaving FPL with a balance of over $1.2 billion. Over the current four-year settlement agreement, we continue to expect FPL to make 
capital investments of between 32 to $34 billion. Our capital investment plan is well established and focused on enhancing what we believe is one of the best customer value propositions in the industry. Key indicators show that the Florida economy remains healthy and Florida continues to be one of the fastest growing states in the country. FPL's third quarter retail sales increased 3% from the prior year comparable period due to warmer weather, which had a positive year-over-year impact on usage per customer of approximately 2%. As a result, FPL observed solid underlying growth in third quarter retail sales of roughly 1% on a weather-normalized basis. Now, let's turn to energy resources, which reported adjusted earnings growth of approximately 21% year-over-year. Contributions from new investments increased 11 cents per share year-over-year, while our existing clean energy portfolio declined 2 cents per share, which includes the impact of weaker year-over-year wind resource. The comparative contribution from our customers supply and trading and gas infrastructure businesses increased by four cents per share and one cent per share respectively. All other impacts reduced earnings by eight cents per share. This decline reflects higher interest costs by six cents per share, half of which is driven by new borrowing costs to support new investments. Energy resources had a record quarter of new renewables and storage origination, adding approximately 3,245 megawatts to the backlog, which is the first time we have exceeded three gigawatts in a single quarter. Although we will remind you that signings can be lumpy quarter to quarter, we do believe this is a terrific sign of strong underlying demand for new renewable generation. With these additions, our backlog now totals over 21 gigawatts after taking into account roughly 1,025 megawatts of new projects placed into service since our second quarter call. We also removed roughly 1,180 megawatts from our backlog, including roughly 800 megawatts of projects in New York following an adverse decision by Nasserta two weeks ago. We are optimistic that these projects will ultimately move forward, but are removing them from backlog for now. The remaining megawatts were removed due to permitting challenges. Overall, we remain on track to achieve our renewable development expectations of roughly 33 to 42 gigawatts through 2026. This quarter's backlog additions include roughly 455 megawatts to repower existing wind facilities which includes energy resources share of approximately 740 megawatts of repowers within the NextEra Energy Partners portfolio, which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. As a reminder, in a repower, we invest roughly 50% to 80% of the cost of a new build, are able to refresh and enhance the performance of the turbine equipment, and start a new 10 years of production tax credit collectively resulting in attractive returns. Energy Resources has previously repowered roughly six gigawatts of its approximately 23 gigawatt operating wind portfolio. And we believe we will be able to repower much of our existing wind portfolio in the coming years. Also included in the backlog additions are roughly 250 megawatts of standalone battery storage projects co-located with existing wind and solar facilities. The combination of the standalone storage tax credit and the ability to utilize existing interconnection capacity from our operating renewables and storage footprint positions us well to serve our customers' growing needs for capacity. Turning now to our third quarter 2023 consolidated results, Adjusted earnings from corporate and other decreased by one cent per share year over year. Our long-term financial expectations remain unchanged. We will be disappointed if we are not able to deliver financial results at or near the top end of our adjusted EPS expectation ranges in each year from 2023 
through 2026. From 2021 to 2026, we continue to expect that our average annual growth and operating cash flow will be at or above our adjusted EPS compound annual growth rate range. And we continue to expect to grow our dividends per share at roughly 10% per year for at least 2024 off a 2022 base. As always, our expectations are subject to our caveats. Going forward, we plan to fund the business in a manner similar to how we have historically done so at both FPL and Energy Resources. This includes utilizing cash flow from operations for roughly half of our funding needs, in addition to tax equity, project finance, and corporate debt. The sale of tax credits is serving as a new source of capital funding for NextEra Energy. We expect to transfer roughly $400 million in tax credits in 2023 and expect this amount to grow over the next couple of years to approximately $1.6 to $1.8 billion in 2026. This dynamic has reduced NextEra Energy's and capital recycling needs including those previously met via sales to NextEra Energy Partners, which has historically averaged roughly $1 billion of annual cash proceeds. Let me address future equity issuances specifically. Our balance sheet and financial discipline remain core to our strategy. As we find attractive investments for our customers and shareholders, we expect to fund those investments in a way that maintains the strength of our balance sheet. As a reminder, over the last five years, we have issued roughly $1.5 billion annually on average of equity in the form of equity units. We do not expect to issue any equity for the balance of 2023 and expect our year-end credit metrics to exceed those specified by the agencies to support our credit rating our current ratings. From 2024 through 2026, we would expect our total equity needs to be no more than $3 billion in total with continued reliance on equity units to satisfy our equity needs, which have no dilution for the first years. We believe FPL and energy resources are well positioned to manage interest rate volatility in the current environment. At FPL, we primarily rely on the surplus mechanism to offset higher interest rates for the benefit of customers. In addition, FPL's rate agreement already provided for an ROE adjustment to 11.8%, enabling it to earn a higher ROE in the current higher rate environment. We expect that FPL will be able to absorb much and potentially all of the cumulative effects of the current interest rate environment through the use of the surplus mechanism over the remaining settlement period. Consistent with the expiration of the current rate agreement, FPL expects to file a rate case in early 2025 for new rates effective 2026. For energy resources and corporate and other, we now have $20.5 billion of interest rate hedges in place. While the amounts vary as we add and settle hedges, the tenor of the swaps are between five and 10 years and have a weighted average rate of roughly 3.75%. Swaps allow us to mitigate the impact of interest rate changes on energy resources backlog returns and capital holdings $12.8 billion of debt maturities from 2024 through 2026. Specifically, these swaps allow us to hedge the project level debt funding we expect to issue on our renewables backlog, as well as a portion of the $12.8 billion of new term maturities. To put this all in perspective, Next Era Energy Sensitivity for an immediate 50 basis point upward shift in the yield curve has essentially no expected adjusted EPS impact on 2023 and 2024 and has on average three to five cents of expected adjusted EPS impact in 2025 and 2026, which is equivalent to approximately 1% of our adjusted EPS expectations. 
This sensitivity, of course, assumes we do not implement other offsetting initiatives, including, among others, our normal process of cost reduction and capital efficiency opportunities. Our backlog is in good shape and is benefiting from our interest rate swaps, global supply chain management capabilities, and the ability to procure equipment, materials, and balance of plant services at scale across our portfolio. The expected returns on equity for our backlog are mid-teens for solar and over 20 for wind and storage. As we have done historically, we price our power purchase agreements commensurate with current market conditions, including our current cost of capital in order to maintain appropriate returns. In addition, at the time of our final investment decision, before we commit significant capital to our backlog projects, we are utilizing interest rate swaps on contracts that we were entered into when rates were lower to maintain our return expectations. We remain financially disciplined and pass on projects that don't meet our return expectations. Going forward, we are encouraged by the trends we are seeing in lower equipment pricing for solar panels and batteries, given increased competition globally and declining prices for materials, which we believe will help offset the impacts of higher interest rates on power purchase agreement prices. We are optimistic that demand will remain resilient due to the factors you all know well, including the continued cost competitiveness of renewable energy relative to alternative forms of generation. Importantly to date, demand has remained strong as evidenced by our substantial new additions to backlog this quarter. Now let's turn to NextEra Energy Partners. As a reminder, the partnership is a financing vehicle that grows its distribution by acquiring assets with long-term contracted high quality cash flows and financing those acquisitions at low cost. Over the years, NextEra Energy Partners has been able to rely on low cost financing to help drive its distribution growth. To meet its financing needs in recent years, the partnership has relied primarily on convertible equity portfolio financing that have a low cash coupon during their term and convert into equity over time. A significant amount of the equity required to be issued to buy out these financings began coming due this year and over the next several years, which we believe contributed to the partnership's trading yield, almost doubling at the same time interest rates were rising. Consequently, the partnership's cost of capital increased, which made it difficult to support a 12% growth rate in a way that is sustainable and in the best interest of unit holders over the long term. By reducing the growth rate to 6%, NextEra Energy Partners' LP distribution rate is now comparable to its peers, and the partnership does not expect to require growth equity until 2027. In order to meet these objectives, the partnership is focused on first executing against its transition plan. As a reminder, the transition plans include successfully entering into agreements to sell the Texas natural gas pipeline portfolio and me natural gas pipeline assets this year and in 2025, respectively. Doing so will enable the partnership to address the equity buyouts associated with the STX midstream, the 2019 NEP pipelines, and NEP renewables to convertible equity portfolio financing due through 2025. Through the period of our current financial expectations, that would leave a small equity buyout of roughly $147 million on the Genesis Holding Convertible Equity Portfolio Financing in 2026. The partnership is continuing its process to sell the Texas Pipeline Portfolio and expects to have an update on or before our fourth quarter call in January. NextEra Energy Partners is focused on executing against its growth plan for unit holders. That plan involves organic growth, specifically repowerings of approximately 1.3 gigawatts of wind projects, as well as acquiring assets from energy resources or third parties at favorable yields. Importantly, Next Energy Partners does not expect to need an acquisition in 2024 to meet the 6% growth in distributions per unit target. 
Today, we're announcing plans to repower approximately 740 megawatts of wind facilities through 2026, which require the final approval of the customer's board of directors, which is expected to be received in the near term. The repowerings are projected to generate attractive CAFTI yields, and the partnership expects to fund the repowerings with either tax equity or project-specific debt. Repowerings represent an efficient way to support the partnership's growth target. Overall, we are pleased with this progress and remain focused on executing additional repowering opportunities in the future across Xera Energy Partners' roughly 8 gigawatt wind portfolio. To minimize the volatility associated with changes in interest rates and support the growth plan, the partnership also executed roughly $1.9 billion to hedge refinancing costs for the 2024 and 2025 maturities. The re resulting expected refinancing costs of the maturities are factored into our expectations. Turning to the detailed results, Nexera Energy Partners' third quarter adjusted EBITDA was $488 million and cash available for distribution was $247 million. New projects, which primarily reflect contributions from approximately 1,100 net megawatts of new long-term contracted renewable projects acquired in 2022, and the approximately 690 net megawatts of new projects that closed in the second quarter of this year, contributed approximately $66 million of adjusted EBITDA and $32 million of cash available for distribution. The third quarter adjusted EBITDA contribution from existing projects increased by approximately $5 million year over year. Third quarter results for adjusted EBITDA and cash available for distributions were positively impacted by the incentive distribution rights fee suspension and provided approximately $39 million of benefit this quarter, more than offsetting the cash available for distribution impacts of lower PAYGO payments driven by lower wind resource at existing projects. Yesterday, NextEra Energy Partners Board declared a quarterly distribution of $0.86.75 cents per common unit or $3.47 per common unit on an annualized basis, which reflects an annualized increase of 6% from its second quarter 2023 distribution per common unit. From a base of our second quarter 2023 distribution per common unit at an annualized rate of $3.42, we continue to see 5 to 8% growth per unit per year in LP distributions per unit, with a current target of 6% growth per year as being a reasonable range of expectations through at least 2026. For 2023, we expect an annualized rate for the fourth quarter 2023 distribution that is payable in February of 2024 to be $3.52 per common unit. Nextera Energy Partners expects run rate contributions for adjusted EBITDA and cash available for distributions from its forecasted portfolio at December 31st, 2023 to be in the range of $1.9 to $2.1 billion and $730 to $820 million, respectively. As a reminder, year-end 2023 run rate projections reflect calendar year 2024 contributions from the forecasted portfolio at year-end 2023. The adjusted EBITDA and related cash available for distributions associated with the Texas pipeline portfolio have been excluded from these run rate financial expectations. As always, our expectations are subject to our caveats. While NextEra Energy Partners navigates through this current environment, it's important not to lose sight of the value of the underlying portfolio. NextEra Energy Partners is the seventh largest producer of electricity from the wind and the sun in the world with over 10 gigawatts of renewables in operation. The partnership owns renewable projects that deliver high quality cash flows in 30 states, serving 94 customers with an average counterparty credit rating of triple B plus via contract with an average, with an average remaining contract life of 14 years. We remain optimistic the partnership can be an attractive vehicle to own existing renewable assets over the long term. We want the partnership to be successful and separately to address a question we've been receiving from some investors, NextEra Energy has no plans to buy back NextEra Energy Partners. With that, I'll turn the call over to John. Thanks, Kirk. Let me briefly address NextEra Energy Partners. It's been a difficult year and we have a lot of work to do. 
As Kirk shared, we are focused on executing against our transition plans and look forward to providing an update on the Texas Pipeline Portfolio sales process on or before the fourth quarter earnings call. We are also focused on delivering LP distribution growth of 6% through at least 2026, and the repowerings we announced today are a good start towards achieving that objective. At Next Air Energy, our foundations are rooted in FPL, the nation's largest electric utility, and Next Air Energy Resources, the world's leader in renewables. Both businesses have performed very well, complement each other, and push one another to be even better. This is validated by the solid financial and operating results both continue to deliver and the excellent progress we are making against our development expectations. Over recent weeks, we met with many of our investors and have welcomed your feedback. In response, we have addressed many of the questions we heard from you in our remarks today and in the presentation materials you now have. Along those lines, I want to reiterate the solid fundamentals on which NextEra Energy is built and our outstanding prospects for future growth, having just completed our annual strategy review process with our board of directors. FPL remains among the best utilities in the United States, achieving top operational performance across key metrics while maintaining the industry's lowest cost structure, one of the cleanest emissions profiles, and a customer bill that is roughly 30% lower than the national average. It is located in one of the fastest growing states with what we believe is one of the country's most constructive regulatory environments. FPL has by far the lowest non-fuel O&M of any large utility in the nation. Over the last 20 years, our relentless focus on costs, efficiency, and low bills have saved customers nearly $15 billion in fuel cost alone. Year after year, FPL receives top accolades for reliability, despite operating on a peninsula and historically facing a high probability for hurricanes. It has plans to add approximately 20 gigawatts of solar over the next 10 years for the benefit of its customers, while undergrounding its distribution system to lower operating costs and withstand the impacts of hurricanes to help keep the Florida economy, which is now the 16th largest in the world, running on all cylinders. We believe FPL is the highest quality regulated utility in the country. At Energy Resources, we are just getting started. Renewable penetration as part of the U.S. generating mix currently stands at roughly 16% and is expected to double, reaching over 30% by 2030. As the world's leader in renewable energy with an approximately 20% market share in U.S. renewables origination, Energy Resources stands to benefit significantly from the unstoppable shift towards electrification. Experience and scale matter, and with over 20 years of renewables experience, a 31 gigawatt operating portfolio, a development pipeline of roughly 300 gigawatts of renewables and storage projects, and roughly 150 gigawatts of interconnection queue positions, we are well positioned for future growth. In addition to our scale and competitive advantages that you all know well, our ability to finance cheaper with one of the strongest balance sheets in our sector provides us with an access to and cost of capital advantage. We believe all of this enables us to differentiate ourselves in a complex macro environment to build even more renewables at attractive returns. In short, we believe Energy Resources has built the most competitive and complete renewable energy business in the world in a better position than ever to lead the decarbonization of the U.S. economy. We have spent the last two decades building a world-class clean energy platform powered by our greatest strength, our people, and a culture of continuous improvement that drives innovation and smart clean energy solutions. I want to extend my appreciation to our team today as we remain committed to serving our customers and providing long-term value for our shareholders. Thank you, and now we welcome your questions. Thank you. We will begin the question and answer session. 
to ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please keep your headset before pressing the keys. If at any time a question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Steve Fleischman with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. Um, so just uh, a couple questions. First on the slide uh, on the tax transferability and the, the billion dollars effectively creating six and a half billion of equity content. Could you just talk to that more and just I think if I do the backward math, that's about a 15 percent FFO to debt kind of calculation. Is that kind of what you're using to, to get to that or is there more nuance to it? Yes, yeah, Steve, on, on that slide, I'll, I'll take that. This is John. Uh, you know, we are the example is a billion dollars. You take a billion dollars, you divide by the 18% FFO to debt, that gets you about five and a half billion. You add the billion dollars of cash that you receive, and that gets you to the six and a half billion dollars of equity content on a billion dollar transfer. Got it. Okay. And when you lay out your, that would seem to be a key part since you talked about the transferability. Um, numbers going from 400 million to a billion seven. That's that's a key part, and that would show up in your funding plan in the corporate debt issuances uh, now, since it's not tax equity anymore. That that might be kind of matched against that, or would it be in the tax equity and project? How, how do we think about? Yeah, the, the, way, shows up. the way I think about it is it's going to show up in your um, your your cash flow from operations. That's the cash yep. that you actually receive. And then there's also some equity content that benefits uh, the rest of the sources, uh, including corporate debt issuances. Got it. Okay. Helpful. And then uh, one other question on the uh, – on the – so the tenor of the interest rate swap seems seems pretty long, uh, which is helpful. Um, just when, when we think of how you're using the swaps to kind of uh, basically limit uh, interest rate risk of the projects, how how much project, if there's a billion dollars of a project, how much is project debt going forward, percent of that, let's say, that you might be using a swap against? Yeah, the way, the way you think about it, Steve, it's 70%. So uh, when you think about our backlog, you know, just some rough math, if you take the $20.5 I would think about roughly $15.5 of that or so going against the backlog, and then the balance going against uh, near-term maturities that we have through 2026. But the interest rate sensitivity that we have given you includes – um, our exposure on everything, right? So on the project debt, uh, you know, on the corporate debt issuances, it, it includes it all. Okay, that's helpful. And then just one overall question on the renewables environment. Maybe you could just talk to uh, just a little more color on what you're seeing, because there's been a general view that the higher cost of capital environment is really slowing, uh, you know, renewables growth. And I just maybe just more color on what you know what you're seeing, and are, is there going to be a slowdown that comes you know next quarter because of the move up, or just just more color on the overall environment would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, Steve, I'm I'm going to turn over to Rebecca. Um, but one thing I would say is the renewable business is increasing increasingly. Uh, moving more and more towards the scale players, um, and you can see reasons why. One of them is the ability to have a balance sheet to actually enter into the kind of interest rate hedges that we can enter into. If you can't do that, that really puts you at a significant disadvantage. And then all the other competitive advantages that you're all aware of where, you know, we buy at scale, we build at scale, we operate at scale, and the last point I want to make is the cost of capital advantage. In today's market environment, 
having a strong balance sheet with, um, you know, an ultimate parent with an A-minus rating uh, is really, really important and a super big uh, competitive advantage that we have other uh, over the smaller developers that we uh, compete against. And, you know, it's a big part of our success. But let me turn over to Rebecca to talk more about uh, what she's seeing in the market. Good morning, Steve. Um, so we are thrilled with the, the findings that we posted for this quarter. Um, obviously, Kirk highlighted that 3.2 gigawatts is, is a record for us. Um, it's specifically the first time we've been over 3 gigawatts, uh, and it represents you know, all of the things that I think you would want to see, uh, which is strong returns across the portfolio, a great mix of technologies, a good mix of customer type um, that we signed and entered into these agreements, uh, and also a mix of signings in terms of the dates um, and, and across those technologies. You know, there, there were uh, our first additions to the backlog in, in 2027. I actually think this is slightly disproportionate to what we're seeing in terms of uh, our overall backlog and a, and a strong pipeline of projects that we see going into the fourth quarter, uh, which are far more weighted to a little bit in 24 and a lot more in 25 and 26. Um, but we're really excited about it. So really strong um, and exciting development um, you know, pipeline. And I'll echo John's comments, um, and it's really what we're seeing on the ground, um, that after some weariness over the last couple of years, um, our customers are really you know, drawn to us for our ability to execute. Um, they understand the pipeline that we're building uh, and the resources that we bring to bear to, to you know, get projects successfully built. And I think that increasingly matters. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to address accordingly, but, you know, all signs are, are very positive for one I think today. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Our next question comes from Shar Pariza with Guggenheim Partners. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Morning, Shar. Morning. Morning, Shar. Morning, morning. Uh, just maybe quickly touching on the embedded expectations for NEP. Uh, I guess in terms of the Texas pipeline sale, John, are there any more comprehensive updates on the process? And are you, I guess, are you anticipating any delays or challenges in light of the market conditions? And kind of the reason why I ask is there's obviously a theory out there or a thesis that, that you're having a little bit of an issue offloading these assets. Um, so I'd love to maybe if you can give a little bit more color in in anticipation of your full disclosures. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, let me start by saying, you know, obviously, as we as we said in our prepared remarks, our focus is on selling these pipes, growing at six percent, and putting NEP in a in a position to succeed going forward. So along those lines, we continue to work very diligently uh, on the sales process. We're working with counterparties uh, to get it done and. At the same time, you know, look, this is a little bit more of a of a challenging macroeconomic environment. These are very valuable pipes, and we are, you know, looking for a transaction that maximizes value for uh, unit holders, and we're going to continue to be disciplined. Uh, but in terms of, you know, the progress that we're making, things are continuing to advance uh, and move forward, and we look forward to having a further update uh, uh, either on the fourth quarter call or sometime before that in terms of where we are. John, then just, John do you anticipate uh, the repowering to sort of fully offset the Mead pipeline sale in 25? Hey, Charts, Rebecca, I'll take that one. So hey. we're super excited about uh, repowers uh, as part of the longer-term growth plan within NEP uh, and with such an extensive pipeline of renewable projects uh, to pursue these repowers, you know, it'll be a nice complement to continuing to acquire assets. So it doesn't meet the entire growth plan, but certainly is a nice uh, part of it. Uh, as we talked about in May, uh, we have a total of one3 uh, gigawatts that we see in the near term, and obviously this is a first step forward uh, in order to uh, in, in order to make progress on that. So attractive CAFD yields, as we noted, um, there's still some steps to, to finish, um, but we're also not done with uh, the opportunities to repower other assets in the portfolio. Got it. Perfect. And then just lastly for me, um, just on the sources and uses of cash, <laughs> I think we all really appreciate the uh, 
the enhanced disclosures there. I just, I guess, obviously, given the capital intensive nature of the business, do you anticipate any incremental levers to potentially offset the three billion of equity and three billion of asset sales if? you know, the capital market conditions become a bit more challenged. I guess any reason to rethink around flexing the payout or the balance sheet metrics. Thanks, guys. Yeah, li- listen, thank you. Um, thank you, Shar. And, and and obviously, you know, we are very, very focused, as always, on costs. We're very, very focused on uh, capital uh, productivity uh, and efficiency uh, as well. So those are two levers we always have. And I think our shareholder base is, is very familiar with the success that we've had in our annual cost reduction uh, processes that we run across the, the company. But those are certainly points of focus for us. And look, you know, when I think about um, the three billion of equity and the, the three billion of asset recycling, uh, and look historically at what we've been able to do, I'd be pretty disappointed if we can only do three billion dollars of asset recycling. I mean, not only through NEP, but third parties, and as a reminder, you know, over the last three or four years, we've been very successful uh, in selling renewable projects, not only to NEP, but to third parties. I mean, think about the OTPP transaction, the Apollo transaction, the KKR transaction. So uh, we feel very good about our sources plan that we've we've laid out and uh, uh, look forward to executing against it. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. Congrats. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Arcaro with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. Good morning. Thanks so much for taking my questions. Morning, Dave. Morning, Dave. I'm um, wondering if, uh, it, you know, you mentioned returns, um, over 20% returns for storage and wind. I think that's higher than you've indicated in the past. And uh, assuming that's driven by higher PPA pricing, I um, was wondering if you're seeing, just uh, given higher PPA prices, any impacts to demand in the renewables market here? And h- how you think about that level of return in terms of whether it's sustainable, given the competitive dynamics uh, in uh, in those end markets? Thanks. Dave, I'll take that. Um, as, as you know, we've always you know characterized the backdrop for renewables as a competitive environment. So I'm very proud of how this team, our team, has executed um, across a, an ever-changing environment, um, and I certainly think it's a strength of, of our team, and, and most importantly, the you know the competitive advantages that John has highlighted: um, investment over a long period of time, uh, the ability to work with our supply chain, the ability to work with the folks that we partner with to build the projects and ultimately um, operate these projects uh, well over time. So I think that really contributes to our ability to maintain appropriate returns. Um, and I also think it reflects what you expect us to do, which is adjust to all of the current costs of both building, financing, and operating projects over time. Uh, and we believe that we are uh, success- successfully able to achieve that. Um, in terms of demand, obviously we, we can't fully predict the future, um, but I can tell you that the two data points that I think are really top of mind and, and you know, illustrated from our report today is, is 3.2 gigawatts um, is a fantastic um, sign, I think, of, of demand. Um, and as I highlighted a minute ago to, to Steve's question, a, a good underlying foundation of technology, dates, um, locations, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased. Uh, and also in looking at the pipeline for the fourth quarter, you know, obviously this is a development business. Things can change. Um, but I, I believe that we're – in a good position to continue realizing strong demand, particularly in that 24 to 26 time frame. So based on what we see today, um, very exciting, and I think it's founded on the things that you all know well, uh, which is a backdrop of increasing electrification, so increasing demand uh, for, for generation and capacity value across our sector, and renewables continuing to be the least cost form of generation. So I would hope you would expect the, what I would argue is the best position company uh, to execute well against an environment like that. Great, thanks. That's really helpful. And I uh, was also curious on the tax credit transfers market. Uh, could you touch on what you're seeing um, in terms of demand and interest from counterparties? You know, how deep is that market? 
and what level of, of, of pricing that you're realizing when you're transferring these credits as it becomes a more important uh, source of cash flow over the next few years? Yeah, Dave, uh, I'll take that question. You know, first of all, uh, you know, I, I would argue we have one, we, we have an outstanding tax department and our tax department yeah, together with our treasury group started early and, you know, we've already reached out to 50 of the top U.S. taxpayers and are building relationships and have had terrific execution against our 23 plan. Uh, the demand is extremely robust for tax credit transfers, and we are, we're already um, working on 24, you know, as we speak, uh, having 23, you know, pretty much uh, behind us. And one of the things that really helps Next Era in the tax transfer market is the fact that we have a strong balance sheet. We have an A minus rating from uh, the parent, and we're able to underwrite the credit. And un being able to underwrite the credit is really, really important because we compete against a lot of really small developers that can't. That if you go to the top 50 taxpayers, they've never heard of these companies. They don't know who they are. They don't really know what they do. They know Next Era, and. We can provide an indemnity uh, behind the tax credits that we transfer. Um, it sleeves off our vests, so to speak, to be able to do that. And we get preferred pricing because of it. And uh, uh, so I feel, I feel great about uh, where things stand in terms of our tax credit transfer program. And I'd love to add one point on that because I think it's a, um, a great complement to um, our broader business and particularly the CNI customers uh, that we're – uh, working with actually buy some of the renewable energy. Um, some of the customers that are most active in um, the market in procuring renewable energy are also the ones that are most interested uh, in buying tax credits from us. Um, and I think they really like the value proposition, certainly of the economics, as John highlighted, um, but really like the value proposition uh, supporting uh, and enabling investment in renewable projects. So we see a really deep market, a lot of interest, and uh, and really a lot of cross-selling uh, opportunities across the portfolio. Okay, great. Appreciate all the color. Thanks so much. Our next question comes from Julian Dumoulin Smith with Bank of America. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hey, team. Good morning. Thanks for the time. Morning, Julian. Morning. Hey, good morning. Hey, just going back to the last question a bit, how do you think about the composition of the 25 to $35 billion of, of uh, Project Five tax equity and tax credit transferability? How do you think about your existing tax equity commitments, and how do you think about some of the impacts from a regulatory perspective on the tax equity market? Obviously, you're talking about a robust start to the tax credit transferability. How much does it matter? How much does it play into that 25 to 35 and ultimately, how much TE is contemplated anyway in, in that range, if you will? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that, uh, Julian. You know, first of all, you know, when you look at our tax equity, you know, project finance split, things can move around. But let's just hypothetically think about it as kind of, you know, 50-50. Uh, you know, I think that might be a, a decent, you know, starting place uh, to think about. And, uh, you know, we feel very good about our ability to be able to access, uh, you know, tax equity. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, the regulatory issues I think that, that you point, pointed out, I think, are, are going to get resolved. I think there were some unintended consequences around uh, Basel III, and we have um, had significant discussions with the folks involved uh, on those issues. The administration certainly thinks this was an unintended consequence, as, as do, I think, folks at the Fed. And the administration, I think, is very focused on trying to get a, a, a good resolution um, around it. But, you know, I don't worry about it too much at the end of the day for us. I think, I think the Basel III thing gets fixed. And, you know, worst-case scenario, uh, the banks will, will find other pockets to be able to issue tax equity. We'll be issue, you know, we'll we'll receive our allocation off off the top of the deck like we always do, and you know these relationships that I just spoke about with corporate uh, uh, parties, these 50 folks or so that we've been dealing with, there's no reason they can't step in and provide tax equity financing, and we'll be talking to them about those.
structures as well. And then transferability, which we've already spent some time talking about this morning, can can fill uh, any gap. So long story short, we feel terrific about uh, our ability to source tax equity financing going forward. Got it. So it's, the transferability is not technically part of the 25 to 35, but obviously it's, it's a smooth conversation, right, if I understand that piece. Uh, can you say that again, Julian? The the, the 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 transferability, the credit transferability, technically not included in that twenty five to thirty five as it stands, but it's a fluid oh, question oh, of I'm sorry. how you finance yeah, yeah, going yeah. forward. So, yeah, yeah. The the tax transferability is not in that number. Again, it shows up in cash flow from operations, and then the equity content that's created really, you know, shows up in that corporate debt uh, uh, issuance uh, line. But look look right. at the corporate the cash flow from operations in terms of the dollars that we're receiving for tax credit transfers. Yeah. And then just quickly, if I can, on, on the uh, interest rate uh, question here, thank you again for the additional uh, sensitivities and disclosures here. How do you think about sort of a baseline and the open impact as you, as you roll to kind of 2026? I think it's notable, for instance, you guys reaffirmed through that period with your usual commentary. How do you think about sort of the puts and takes as you roll into that longer dated 26 period? considering the roll off of the, the, the hedges here um, in that I think, period more specifically, if you will. Yeah. So is, couple, is there a way to kind of quantify the interest yeah, rate correct. kind of headwind? Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of points I'll make. One is the, you've seen the sensitivity. So uh, zero uh, impact in 23 or 24, three to five cents in 25 uh, in, in 26 with the five to 10 year, uh, tenors, uh, you know, with uh, the average coupon three three 375 basis points, uh, you know, we feel very good about uh, the protection, you know, that that we have there. You know, we've talked about where FPL sits, and then you know, you think about the project financings, you know, that we that we entered into. We use those hedges. Those those project financings are basically 20 year amortizing debt that have 20 year hedges that then get rolled into them that have the benefit of those swaps. And so when you think about our existing um, project finance portfolio that we have, there's another 4 billion of interest rate swaps that aren't even in the 20 and a half billion that we mentioned to you today that protect and safeguard those as they uh, roll and become due. So long story short, between the 20 and a half billion that we have against the backlog the fact that our existing portfolio is already locked in and hedged, uh, we feel very good about our interest rate exposure. Got it. Excellent. All right, guys. Thank you very much. I'll pass it there. Have a nice one. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Julian. Our next question comes from Carly Davenport with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, appreciate the uh, the incremental disclosure on the funding plan and the asset sales. And just to follow up there, are renewables the only element kind of embedded in that $3 billion in proceeds, or are there any other non-core assets and energy resources that you'd consider monetizing? Yeah, you know, so when I think about it, Carly, uh, you know, renewables, you know, come, come top of mind. Uh, you know, we've had a history over the last several years of being able to recycle, you know, capital through renewables. But remember, too, I mean, we're, you know, we're a large company. We, there, are, there are other uh, assets that could potentially, you know, be available for capital recycling that are non-core. Uh, the FCG transaction that we just, you know, recently announced is a, is a good example of that. And, you know, we'll always look for uh, opportunities if there are situations where, Third parties value assets more than we do. Then, then sure, we'll look to be opportunistic, but it's it's not a core part of the plan. Got it. Okay, great. That's helpful. And then, just as you think about the the timing cadence of the backlog additions and also the dispersion across the different technologies, um, I think Rebecca, you alluded to the fact that the 4Q pipeline is is shaping up to be kind of more weighted to the 24 to 26 timeframe versus this quarter being a little a little bit longer dated, but can you also just talk about the split across wind, solar, and storage? It seems like there's been a step up in solar relative to wind. So just any thoughts on, on how you see that piece evolving going forward would be helpful. Thanks, Carly. I think it's a great question. Um, yes, I, I definitely support that first part of your, of your comment, and it's consistent with what I had said before, that 
Um, I, I think you know this quarter was a little bit anomalous in terms of um, the waiting to 2027, uh, and the pipeline is very much more uh, weighted for what I see today uh, for 24, 25, and 26, with much of it in the 25 and 26 timeframe, just given the fact that we're ending into 24. In terms of the technology, um, obviously we had you know, very strong signings for storage, um, and as Kirk highlighted in the prepared remarks, um, in terms of the probably, maybe not surprise is probably not the the right word, but really you know pleased to see how we're starting to see adoption across a broader set of markets, not just California, but into the Midwest, uh, where our utility customers uh, and obviously some of the CNI are really valuing. Uh, the ability to to incorporate storage for capacity value and in firming and shaping the renewables product. So that's really positive in my mind. On the wind side, I, I think we're still seeing a little bit of the dynam dynamics that shaped up um, as a result of the tax credits um, that we originally, we in the industry, thought were going to phase down uh, after 2020. So we saw a significant amount of a pull forward of demand, uh, and and you know I think that's still you know affecting the industry a little bit. Uh, and then obviously the PTC being extended for solar significantly improved the economics from a relative standpoint, uh, which has been super positive for demand. We still see a lot of geographies where wind is incredibly attractive. Uh, and so I, I feel good about long-term demand for wind, and I also feel really good about long-term demand uh, for repowering projects. Um, obviously, we had a great start. Uh, to the repowering initiative following the IRA extension with uh, over 700 megawatts we talked about today. Obviously, at share uh, for near, it's a little bit less than that. Uh, but when we look across the entire, you know, tens of gigawatts now of renewable projects, there's lots of opportunities to, to repower as well. So overall, across the board, really excited about the opportunities that we have in front of us. That's great. appreciate the color. Our next question comes from Andrew Weisel with Scotia Bank. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. First, uh, two morning, Andrew. questions. Hi. Can you talk a bit about supply chains? Uh, I'd be curious your latest thoughts on the uh, availability and status of supply chains, both for solar equipment as well as for grid level equipment like transformers or switchgears. Uh, sure. Yeah, let me take that, Andrew. So you know, first of all, with supply chain, things are really uh, improved a lot, as, you know, Rebecca, Rebecca just mentioned. You know, we had we have the two issues, right? Circumvention, which has been asked and answered, provided a lot of clarity uh, around what can be done, what can't, and with the presidential proclamation. So in very good shape there. Second was forced labor and making sure that uh, our suppliers are working constructively with customs uh, and border patrol to get their uh, panels, uh, you know, cleared uh, for importation into the country, and so for the most part, you know, all of our all of our uh, you know solar suppliers have been able to do that, and so we are in uh, uh, very good shape there. I think on grid power, uh, I actually, you know, the grid level, you know, issues that you just mentioned. Uh, we're in very good shape on. You know, we had gone long on grid level. Um, uh, equipment, including uh, transformers, and so we have uh, a significant supply uh, in our inventory, and we've also looked forward in a plan for this in terms of trying to make sure that we have equipment available where if our if our customers or the transition transmission owner in the places places that we're building renewables are short on equipment are short on grid level equipment in particular that we we have it in our inventory or enabled and are able to offer that up as a solution and i think one of the big benefits that we have given our scale and given our leverage and the ability to buy uh this equipment in very large quantities and really lock up a lot of the uh the manufacturing lines for these for this equipment it's a it's a true competitive advantage uh, you know, for a renewable business, the way I think about it. Great. Just to clarify, Near is buying this equipment, or SDL? Like, do you keep those separate inventories? Both are. Both are. Because both need it. Okay, great. 
And one quick follow-up, if I may, I'm almost apologizing to bring this up, but the Florida State Supreme Court asked the PSC for some details on their approval of the rate case settlement. Can you just share your expectations around timing of the process and maybe potential outcomes? Hey, Andrew, it's Armando. Um, you're right that the, uh, <clears throat> the Supreme Court remanded the uh, settlement agreement back to, uh, back to the Public Service Commission. Um, our view is that the Public Service Commission is going to take that up um, soon and will likely be in a position uh, early next year, I would say the first quarter of next year, to be able to uh, send that back up to the Supreme Court with the additional details uh, that the Supreme Court is, uh, is looking forward uh, to, uh, to receiving. That process would be very similar to the process, both the timeline and uh, and the materials that the Public Service Commission went through with the Duke uh, case that was remanded uh, by the by the Supreme Court back to the Public Service Commission last year, where the Public Service Commission did not reopen the record. We don't expect our record to be reopened, um, and uh, made sure that uh, they put together. A, uh, a conclusion that uh, would be satisfactory in their view to with, uh, with the Supreme Court and send it back to the Supreme Court. So we think we're on the same process as that Duke case was, and, uh, and we look forward to, uh, to having the Public Service Commission uh, resubmit that again first quarter of next year. Sounds good. Thank you. This concludes our question and answer session, and the conference has also now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may all now disconnect.